It's a poem called Bowlers Anonymous. It appeared in a book called Cemetery Nights. I probably wrote it around 1981. Here comes the woman who wears the plastic prick hooked to a string around her waist, the man who puts girls' panties like a beanie on his head, the chicken molester, the lady who likes great dames, the boy who likes sheep, the old fellow who likes to watch turkeys dance on the top of a hot stove, the bicycle seat sniffer, grasshopper muncher, the bubbles in the bath biter, they all meet each night at midnight, and oh lord, they bowl. From twelve to six, they take it out on the pins as they discuss their foibles with their friends. I'm trying to cut down, says the woman who nibbles the tails of mice. I've thrown away my zippo, says the man who sticks matches between people's toes. There's nothing that can't become a pleasure if one lets it, and so they bowl. They think of that oddly handsome German shepherd face, and they bowl. Their hands quiver at the thought of jamming their fingers in a car door, and they bowl. These are the heroes, these grocers and teachers and postmen and plumbers. They bring snapshots of themselves and scotch tape, then fix their photos to the pins, and they bowl. They focus on their faces at the end of the alley, and they bowl. They see their hunger in their eyes, the twist of anticipation in their lips, and oh, they bowl, bowl to remember, bowl to forget, as the pins with their own bruised faces explode from midnight to six, while in those explosions of wood in which each pin describes an exact arc, they feast on those moments when the world seems to stop and everything conspires to push some fleeting beauty ripening peach or blossoming rose to the queer brink of perfection where it flames, flickers, fades, and is never perfect again. I was particularly interested in this poem because it seems almost quintessential of your poetry and that it contains many of your recurrent ideas. The proletarian, the juxtaposition of the profane, and the exalted. It speaks of the great loneliness of people, yet offers redemption in the guise of the community of bowling. In the workshop yesterday, you spoke about homo ludens, the classic idea of man at play, and yet bowling is one of the less exalted sports. Can you comment on some of these aspects? I think what the poem is taking, on them, we all have within us our relationship between our conscious and our unconscious. And then above that, we have the sniping of our superego. Our unconscious is something that's directed by appetite and anxiety, perhaps a few other things, but appetite and anxiety. And it has no moral sense. It wants this, it wants more. Uh, you look at the ads in any, any magazine. I, I was amazed recently, I put this in a book, the, a novel, you know, looking in Rolling Stone, you know, all the ads at the back for, for various kinds of telephone encounters. All housewives need sex, uh, leather, leather number, I mean, endless <coughs> series of ads. <coughs> Moving to Boston in this, in this fall, looking, you know, glancing through the Boston Phoenix, I mean, there, here are more ads, and they become in times that I've looked at these things, maybe it's just papers are more open. There are a great many people in Boston looking for people to spank them, or to spit on them, or to paddle them, or to whip them. And there are people who are offering themselves professional, specialized in spitting and paddling, not so good at spanking. There are dozens of these ads. Well, these seem to point to a hidden layer of appetite. When you meet a new person, meet a person on the street, Hi, my name's Bob. I like spanking. You never hear that, you know. <laughs> you hear, we present always that improved, better self. Uh, but what we see as we get to know a person more and more, we see these, we get a, a larger sense of these appetites. Well, we don't all engage in these appetites, you know, obviously. But we're all confronted at some point in our life with things that we do, things we should not do. Bowl is Anonymous simply is taking that subject and, and putting, putting a comic, I was going to say comic twist. Comic twist, it's not meant to be funny. I mean, something could be comic without being funny. 
we have our, our ideas about perverts. You know, perverts are elsewhere. I am not perverted. Everyone else shares these, everyone else has these desires, these hidden desires, but my desires, right to the bottom, are A-O-K and clean. We have this other. And what is this other? You know, where, what's being asked about in this poem, finally, is once we understand our own fallen nature, and we all have a fallen nature. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm just using that term, I'm trying to use that term away from its religiosity. We have a conflicted nature. Uh, our unconscious mind, our subconscious, has appetites, which our conscious mind and society disapproves of. Uh, once we become aware of that in our nature, there's that sense of how do you, how do you make the egg whole again? How do you put Humpty Dumpty back? How do you re-knit a virgin? How do you, how do you find uh, that sense of innocence which we all imagine we had someplace in our past? Wasn't there a time on this earth when I was not bad? <laughs> Wasn't there a time when I was that thing? Well, the, the poem tries to address that, and it tries to address it through this basically absurdist metaphor of this explosion of the pins, of something that's, that's perfect for a second, perfect for a second, and then it'll never be perfect again. And these people, these comic figures, basically, are creating, have a community of this. I mean, there's no, <coughs> there's no attempt to, to, uh, to mock, say, AA or anything, but the, but the fact that they have come together, and they have tried to form a community because their guilt, as it were, has forced them out of this proper community, wherever that is. So it tries to address that. And, it, and it's, why is it using these, it's using comic, it's using the absurd, basically to try and jar the reader off his or her pedestal of complacency. In your poem, Bleeder, the perverse desire to make and watch a hemophiliac bleed provides a group of kids at a summer camp for retarded and crippled children a moment of shared meanness, a temporary escape from the private spite. I'm very interested in cruelty and suffering a spectacle as used to unite people. It has a very religious dimension and reminds us that communion is a coming together to re-experience the suffering of Christ. Could you speak of this poem, which seems critical to the religious dimension that is operating in your work? Well, for two summers, when I was 15 and 16, or was it 14, 15 and 16, I worked at crippled children's camps in Pennsylvania. There were camps run by the Easter Seal Foundation. Uh, both lasted eight weeks. So the first summer I was paid for that eight weeks, $50. The next summer I got, a, I think, a $10 raise, so I got $60 plus my rum and board. Uh, it was something that the first five minutes of when, when the kids arrived was horrifying because of their being crippled. I mean, they were, many of them had a polio. I mean, they'd be on braces. These were kids who were mobile. There was another camp for people who were not mobile at all. But many were crippled. Many had Down syndrome. They didn't call they, At that point, they were called just simply mongoloids. They're hemophiliac, one hemophiliac. There were all kinds of people, kids from the ages of 6 to 20, actually. And then you began to, to deal with them. You know, after those five minutes, they became human beings, and, and you stopped seeing, you stopped seeing their, their uh, limitations, their physical limitations. That's one part of the answer. Another part of the answer is, after I had finished writing uh, this book, The Balthus Poems, which precedes the book Black Dog, Red Dog, from which the poem Bleeder comes, I found myself wondering, who am I writing for? What, what, do I, what, am I, what do I expect from the things that I say? And I realized that part of me was still writing for that grade school teacher 
from whom I learned writing. Miss Day. Miss, I think she was Miss. She seemed like, uh, she was a gray-haired woman in East Lansing, Michigan. She had a pet canary in the classroom, and if you're a good kid, you got to take the canary home on the weekend. Uh, I never got to take the canary home. <laughs> she made us all sign the pledge that we would never smoke and never drink. I went home and tore up a, a carton of my parents' camel cigarettes that irritated them immensely, and I poured out a bottle of, I don't think it was whiskey, I think it was sherry. Anyway, <laughs> hey, at nine years old, I was tough. <laughs> I had a moral fiber that you couldn't break with a Swiss Army knife. Anyway, I realized that I was, that part of me was writing to be liked, that I was censoring my writing, that I wanted the reader of what I wrote to think, isn't this guy <coughs> sensitive, thoughtful, uh, responsible, a good citizen? I would vote for him. I realized that this was really destroying my writing, that it was inserting between, it was inserting in that process a, an act of censorship, that I was making a judgment within the act of writing of what was proper material, what was improper material, what was a proper approach, what was a proper tone, what was a proper subject matter, etc. And so in Black Dog, Red Dog, I try and overturn that and take subjects from everything. And and the bleeder becomes part of that. I mean, here's this, this kid, this innocent kid, who is a severe hemophiliac, who comes to this camp and who can't do anything. The camp has taken him by mistake. He, uh, if he gets the slightest cut, he'll just drain out like a, a broken Coke bottle. And so he's, he's, he's put in safe places. Well, if you're in the, in the woods in Pennsylvania, there are not a lot of safe places, so they put it, but they put him places. And then you realize that you and everyone else would just like to see it happen. What would happen? This perverse, what would happen if he started to bleed? Wouldn't that be interesting? I mean, as a, in, a, in this, take it out of any morality, but just, what would happen? What would happen if this happened? And you realize that you and everyone else is thinking this. I mean, you, you talk about it, you, find, you see this. And you feel immensely guilty. This, oh God, I shouldn't think this. I should never think this. What an awful thing to think, you know. And you're confronting this all the time. Wouldn't it be interesting to see him bleed? No, don't say that again. And, and you confront this. All the poem is about that confrontation with the self, of using something and use, I mean, the poem is not the event. The poem is taking that event and turning it into something else. And the actual events of the poem did not occur, except the fact that there was a hemophiliac at this camp. Again, that works to or ideally, I mean, it, the poem is about something, somebody confronting himself with these basically unconscious uh, desires which have suddenly risen to the surface. I'd like to see that guy bleed. <clears throat> and then realizing that this is a public feeling and trying to come to terms with it. Well, for me, in the, in the writing of that poem, I had to get away from any sense of, of uh, Jesus, they're going to think ill of me for this. They're going to think that I was the person here. They're going to think, you know, my stock's going to go down. I may not get that gold star next to my name, after all. Uh, and it was a way of trying to get around that. The poem was also, at that time, and that poem was written in a kind of loose blank verse, and more blank verse than I'd tried before. And trying to give the... Uh, the subject matter, the kind of, uh, if I can say, call it that, roughness, antagonism, confrontational, the confrontational nature, the, to soften the confrontational nature of the subject matter with an iambic, uh, loose iambic pentameter, push, drive, form. I'd kind of like to follow that, that note of violence um, with the different questions kind of relating back to your mystery books again. Um, do you feel that society might be so chaotic or violent today that the idea of the uh, mystery novel uh, can no longer serve its previous role as a, as a surrogate intimacy with violence? Are, are, you, are you attempting to uh, deal with the banality of evil? Well, I... 
the difficulty with our, this is a technical difficulty. The technical difficulty with movies and some mystery novels and the events of the newspapers today is that we're confronted with increasingly violent images of dis- and detailed images of destruction. So how do you then deal with this? You know, if you write a mystery novel that has a simple shooting that happens off camera, you know, there is an element of boredom to this then. I mean, do you have to try and top this? How do you do this? Obviously, there are mystery writers who have extremely bloody elements, extremely bloody elements, in order to catch, in order to take this interest, keep up this interest. I'm not good at that, and I don't, I don't, I can't imagine using the violence for the sake of violence. The violence is always a tool. If you read by anticipating what comes next, then how you, how the writer deals with that anticipation is through surprise. A poem does it primarily through surprise. A fiction a piece of fiction does it primarily through suspense. A joke is a form of surprise. It's, a, it's an abrupt change of tone. A shock is a form of surprise. A hand suddenly coming through the window and grabbing you is a form of surprise. And all this functions on the page. I think then in a mystery novel, I mean, I was saying yesterday about Chekhov, that Chekhov in a story wants to enliven a pool of blood that he's put on the floor, and he enlivens it by putting a a small white boiled potato in the center of the pool of blood. I would approach it then as that, as through language and image, rather than through... Uh, making the (coughs) crime even more brutal. On the other hand, I say, (laughs) on the other side of this, this novel that I have coming out in May called The Church of Dead Girls begins with a description of of three girls, tied dead girls tied to chairs someplace, and they've been there for a long time. And their clothes have been, they have handmade clothes that have been put on them and there are candles all over the place and there's a, there's a pseudo-religious appearance to this. But it's very detailed in describing their faces. I mean, one of them has been there for three months and so on. And this is very, as, as detailed as I could make it. But it becomes, uh, all of this at some point becomes a dealing with the material. I have information that I'm trying to get from my head to the page, into the reader's head. Do I, uh, do I take their attention by making it bigger and louder and noisier? That was Elvis's way. Or do I try and do it through, through the form, through the, through the writing, through the detail? I try. Uh, ideally, I do it that way. I mean, there's plenty of mystery writers who, as I say, who make it bloodier and bloodier and bloodier. And that there's no end to that. The world can always top you. So you have to find a way of language. And the same thing with a poem. It has to be done through language. It has to be done through image. It has to be done through the skill with manipulating words. It can't be done by excess. The one thing that's, that Aristotle points to as being the failure in tragedy is spectacle. That the, the tragedy, the play that depends on spectacle is the weakest of them all. And the temptation is always to go towards spectacle because that's, that's the easy, you know, just slash your throat, make a dirty joke, whatever. That's the weakest way. It's a betrayal of the language. And I cannot compete with a movie. I cannot, some movie, you have a movie where a guy's cracked up a train and he's got this bus rolling down a hill and there are flames shooting all over the place and there's a plane crashing. I can't compete with that. I have to do, I have to simply put a small white boiled potato in a pool of blood. Your 1993 novel, uh, The Wrestler's Cruel Study, is a complex philosophical novel in which early Christian theology is counterposed with Nietzsche and which profess- professional wrestlers act out precepts of Gnosticism and Manichaeanism. In your earlier inter- interview having to do with the detective novel, uh, you said that the detective novel is not a fully developed argument. It seems to me that uh, the uh, Wrestler's Cruel Study is clearly a fully developed argument. Of course, if you could have said it any other way, you might not have needed to write the, the novel. 
but I wonder if you would uh, tell us something about this extraordinary work's conception and development, specifically as to why and how you combined uh, uh, philosophy with the rather unlikely spectacle of uh, professional wrestling. Well, that was a complicated novel. It took me quite a while, but there was a, a way of its being a number of metaphors coming together. My own interests in history, uh, a history book which I'd read years ago by Stephen Runciman, on a great historian called The Medieval Manichae, which is finally a story of, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the heresies in southern France and, and how those heresies came about in the 13th century. The whole idea of Gnosticism, which also is obviously connected to, to Zoroastrianism, which, which posits, before this gets too dull, that, that good and evil came, were born simultaneously. Were born simultaneously. And they were always dealing with this within the world. Uh, at this period when Christianity begins, and even in the few centuries before Christianity, the late, or not late, but different groups, different Jewish groups, you had all this influence of, of, uh, of a kind of Gnosticism. <coughs> and uh, in the first Christian groups, you have many, many Christian groups in the first few centuries. And you have many different Bibles, and there are many, and what you see in those first 400 years is uh, an establishing of the canon that the Bible that we have is, <coughs> is finally put together by St. Augustine. And he's selecting uh, a series of books, as it were. I mean, he's, obviously he doesn't do it by himself, but there are whole kinds of things. A series of books out of many, many, many different books. And what's being created is a narrative, a narrative in which there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. In the original stories of the Bible, in Genesis, for instance, the snake is not the devil. The snake is just a snake. The snake is just a guy seeking to make trouble, snake being snake-like. What you have in the, uh, in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is, is in some ways the most improbable book, but it ends out the story of the Bible. It makes the devil into the bad guy. It makes it clear that this has been a narrative from the beginning to the end. And it, and it, and it forces this narrative on, on all these different books which come, which are written I mean, the earliest of, of 12th century B.C., is it Samuel or 11th century? I mean, it's a very old book. To the, to the books uh, of the New Testament. Well, this is interesting to me. Uh, St. Augustine himself was, had been a Gnostic. He believed that good and evil had, had been formed spon spontaneously together. And then he has a conversion. But in his conversion, he remains a Gnostic. So he has good is formed, and a nanosecond later, evil is formed. Evil coming from pride. But the, very, the two, are, you know, but he separated them. You know. So then you look at how do you talk about uh, man's responsibility to his fellow creatures, anybody's responsibility, and looking at metaphors for this, then uh, wrestling. Contempor or what passes for wrestling. Contemporary wrestling is clearly Gnostic. It's the forces of darkness against the forces of light. You know? and, and we see this in the most bizarre forms. You know? I mean, it's hard to be hype. How can you write hyperbole about contemporary wrestling when it in itself is the most, how can you exaggerate what has been exaggerated to the end? And so in that novel, it becomes a matter of using this other series. Uh, of tales, these Gnostic tales. Well, also then within the novel, there are a series of, of grim fairy tales that are retold. Uh, the fisherman's wife and the flounder, flounder in the sea, won't you? I mean, the, so the guy, even the flounder, is called in the book Mr. Lenguado, which is a Spanish word for sometimes for flounder. Uh, the frog prince is retold. There, there are about five stories that re are retold in this, in modern terms. And, the, and they fit within this plot. But the main story is the story of this, of this wrestler, of, of his being educated to accept his dark side, <coughs> and his going through a process of education which will allow him to brace, embrace his dark side, to embrace his totality, basically. That at, at the beginning, he is purely this comic book figure. He believes in goodness. 
he cannot hit person. He cannot hurt anybody. And therefore, he is a fragmented human being. And this book is a story of his education, of his, of his learning to get to the point where he can embrace his own darkness and end up, like any of us, a totality. Well, it's drawing, then, on metaphors from different places, and it's working, then, on different kinds of, with different kinds of tones, of, of using the comic in different ways, of ser- seriously comic, absurdly comic, all different ways. And then, then it's done. And there, then some big pile of pages. And, <laughs> and uh, I love doing it. I mean, it'd be, it was a... When you wake up in the morning, you're lying there looking at the ceiling, your mind's saying, what in the hell is it all about, Alfie? And, uh, and slowly you see the day creeping over the, the windowsill. And you're, look, you're looking at your, the big problems and little problems. And there's a way then that in writing you're addressing all those things. You're, you're addressing the world and you're addressing your own small private disaster. And, uh, and you're taking those things and you're making something that's finally separate. And we are, in our nature, tremendously flawed. Uh, well, yeah, we're ter- <laughs> we're ter- we like things that we should not like. You know. There was a bare midriff in that elevator coming up to the fourth floor that took me away from thoughts of literature and kindness and, uh, and how one should properly live. <laughs> We have to. Ad- we, how do we address that? How do we accept that? You know? And literature is a way of, of dealing with that. Uh, if we imagine that we are good, if we imagine that other people could commit the Holocaust and not us, if we imagine that Nazis were a different breed of person, and that, <coughs> then that we could never push somebody into a gas chamber then we guarantee that it'll happen again. The uh, work does uh, seem somewhat uh, anomalous as compared to some of your previous fiction. In a uh, previously published interview, you remarked that you were a writer of realism, and yet the the wrestler's cruel study seems to be a uh, departure into a (coughs) um, fantastical sort of reality. And I was wondering, uh, whether this was uh, what you've been working toward throughout your uh, novel writing career, or whether uh, you view it as uh, continuing to be an anomaly. I think that the anomalous elements in that book, I don't think they're anomalous. I mean, I think the elements in that book are also in Bowler's Anonymous. And there's a, a previous book called Cold Dog Soup, which uh, in some ways is a forerunner of the wrestler's cruel study. Cold Dog Soup takes place in New York City. <coughs> it's about, <coughs> it takes place in a, tw- in a night, nighttime, a 12 hour period. And it's about two guys trying to sell a dead dog in New York City. I mean, New York being what it is, you can sell almost anything. And these guys are trying to sell a dead dog. Uh, it's, it's very absurdist. I mean, a guy, a guy goes to, meets this girl, goes to her house, for dinner, her mother's there, the dog, elderly dog is there, uh, the girl makes it clear that we've just got to get mother to bed as soon as possible and then we can have sex. But then during dinner the dog dies and the mother has a fit. This is like, it's Saturday night, nobody will pick up the dog, they can't do anything with the dog. All the city relief societies say, well, you're going to have to put it in the closet until Monday. And the mother says, please carry the dog. The guy realizes he's not going to have sex with this girl until he gets rid of the dog. He takes the dog out. He tries to get a cab. He can't get a cab. It, the theaters are just letting out or, or just starting. A, a Haitian cab driver, gypsy cab driver, picks him up. He's got the dog with the dog's bowls, collar, and a few dog toys in the series of black plastic garbage bags. The gypsy cab driver says, uh, gets him to say, what's in, what's in the bag? What's in the bag? guy says, i got a dog in the back. He says, well, what are you going to do with that dog? He says, well, I'm going to bury the dog. And the gypsy cab driver says, bury it. This is New York, man. We can sell it. And so they go off on, the, on this thing that takes them through the night. And it's a, it's a moral tale. 
an absurdist moral tale. There are other things that are going on through this. Well, basically that's another tone, another way of looking at reality. It's another, you know, we look out at the world, we call this, what is this thing? You know, do you see that cup the same way I see it? You see a cup, a different cup. You're, si you're sitting, in, sitting in a different place. You don't see that cup as I see it. You can't see it. Also, you're seeing that cup through the filter of your own history, blah, blah, blah. I mean, obviously, we'll both pick out the same cup. But there are differences to that cup. Well, whether you treat a subject matter with pure realism, pure absurdity, these are all different hues on a scale that you choose. How are you going to... These are your tools, man. I mean, how are you going to approach the subject? What tone are you going to use? Gregor Samsa awoke after a night of uneasy dreams to discover he'd been transformed into a gigantic insect. Hey, that's pretty... That's pretty impressive stuff. You know, what, how does how does Kafka decide to begin there? You know, you wouldn't accept that sentence anyplace else. I mean, it's your first. He has us. Kafka must have been so happy when he hit upon that. He must have stepped away from his desk and rolled on the floor. But he has something that he wants to tell us about our existential nature. What if a guy woke up as a cockroach? What's he going to do? The other thing that pleases Kafka in that is to make the reader swallow it. If you can take this story of a guy waking up in the morning as a bug and having to deal with life as a bug, <coughs> you can do anything. And so he's doing many things. I mean, it, it, Kafka is working out a complicated, serious, intricate philosophy. And he's just giggling at the same time. And he's doing other things. You know, he's writing a story. He's doing, he's putting words together. All this together, and that becomes part of the joy of it. You have material. You're working toward a poem. You're working toward a novel. These ideas are coming together. You are thinking of metaphors that you can use, and at some point you think of the tone, of the language you're going to use, of how this is going to be said, of what's the most f effective presentation for this. And that determines how you select these things. Wrestler's Cruel Study, I mean, I spent a lot of time on that book. I mean, I, I'm very fond of that book. People found it a confusing book. You know, they, they were not, it was not economically a success. And that, uh, that too be then becomes a kind of issue for me as a writer, I think. But I love <coughs> it. I mean, I, and it was, it was wonderful having a number of basically squirrely ideas how can I make a guy into a cockroach? Mm -hmm. And making it work. Making it work. I mean, it's like carving Mount Rushmore with a Swiss army knife. It's a lot of fun. In your collection of essays, Best Words, Best Order, in the essay Cemetery Nights, you say that a poem has the ability to sensitize people toward themselves and the world around them. This makes each poem a political act. And even though I expect no results from these political acts, it keeps me writing. What is the role of the poet as we face the year 2000? How would you like to see the world transform? Well, to write in a vacuum, to write things which stop with myself, which do not communicate, uh, which are written, say, so obscurely or in such a private language that they do not transcend myself, has all the drawbacks of masturbation. Language is always a communication. If I'm, if I'm writing something, I'm also then writing something that I want to be read. It doesn't need to be read today, doesn't it, but it, it holds out the promise to me that it will be read. <clears throat> and so the, the, whatever it is the story, poem, whatever is also then a kind of argument it works as an argument it, it, it works as an argument in that it's meant to convince it's not necessarily analytical but it means, means to convince so if my question is what is it to be a human being how does one live what's one's responsibility to one's fellow creatures I, don't, I mean, I, I don't think about that when I'm writing, but that's the, that's the question that's back there. <clears throat> then, 
that's going to affect the making of this thing where I start, where I end all, all these choices <coughs> I was saying in this other class a human being tries to live in one moment of time a, a, a moment where we don't worry about the past don't worry about the future nothing bad coming nothing bad kind we're just in this moment we're in mall time we're in casino time daylight 24 hours glitter glitter wherever we look nothing changes you know we don't age our mortality is taken from us but we see we use life as constant distraction we don't age art <coughs> takes the curve art tries to remind the reader or the viewer or the audience of the curve of human life where you've come from, where you're going. <coughs> it doesn't do this moralistically, but just this is part of the information of the work, where you've come from, where you're going. In that way, it jars a person off that pedestal of complacency, or it has the possibility of doing that, and leads the person himself, herself, to think about that question. Not that the, re the reader's arm is being twisted necessarily, but it forces the reader to think, you know, what would I do if I woke up as a cockroach? Jesus, wouldn't my landlord be pissed? What would I do in this situation? How would I do this? And it, it does this often through, a for, through, through identification. In a novel, there's always someone who's the reader. In a short story, there's always an event which engages the reader. You don't necessarily identify with a character in a short story, but you identify with his condition. You identify with his sudden, in the classical short story, his sudden moment of epiphany, where he realizes, where he says to himself, my life is fucked up pretty bad. And at that, mo that moment, we catch on in some way. There's a wonderful book by Frank O'Connor, The Lonely Voice, and he talks about this. And he talks about the first short story being Gogol's overcoat. And, and Gogol, the, kid, the, the dumb clerk, who saved all his money and finally gets an overcoat and somebody takes it and the guy just screams you know. and O'Connor says "In that, everybody's been laughing at this guy but there's another clerk who listens to the scream and in the scream he has this sense of, of his own connection to this guy I am your brother and the, and the way that this works within the story of the way this how the reader is suddenly engaged he takes this character that, is, that he's been laughing at for pages and suddenly there's this moment of connection I am your brother and the effect of that on the reader that it becomes part of the pleasure part of the, part of the whole experience of the art well the fact that it teaches us something I, I mean I want to take that out of a a dogmatic a a uh, context really but that's always there you know that's part of our pleasure in the reading the story that is no more than the sum of its parts the novel that's no more than the sum of its parts is finally no more than decorative it's it's like wallpaper you go back again to that kafka phrase <coughs> literature should be a frozen literature should be an axe to smash the frozen sea of the heart you know that's interesting we are, t we are, I mean, in order to live, we have to give ourselves really thick skins. We see awful things all the time. And, we, and, and uh, our skin gets thicker and thicker. Literature or art should not nag us, but it should lead us to think of the entire arc of human life. Who are we? How do we live? What's our responsibility to one another? Beyond that, Above that, more important than that, art has to be fun. You know. First, it's fun. It's a pleasure. <coughs> Otherwise, you just take castor oil all day. You wouldn't have to read. <laughs> That'll be it for you. <laughs> in uh, Saratoga Examiner, Lucy Feinstein, a character described as a novelist living and teaching in New York, says that a writer's a good disorderer of information while an academic is just the opposite. She goes on to say, a writer fits into an English department about as snugly as a fox into a Spartan boy's tummy. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you agree in any way with your character 
Um, and would you comment on some of the difficulties of being a writer or teaching writing in an academic environment? Well, I'm afraid I use Lucy Feinstein a little bit too much as my own soapbox. But I think that, that what she says is true, that there's that uh, if you're engaged in the investigation of human totality, then there's certain things that you constantly come up against. This isn't simply an English department, but, it, but in any collective group, for instance. It means then that you are beginning to question or not to take as sacred those things which that collective has to take as sacred, uh, which can be simply, uh, I mean, the tremendous emphasis on diversity, for instance, now. I, you know, I share that emphasis on diversity. You know, we, every human being should have his or her opportunity to fulfill his or her potential as a human being. Yet at the same time, there is our absurdist nature. Someone slips on a banana, we laugh. Now, it's not politically correct to laugh. You know. uh, well, if you, if you pretend that you are the sort of person who would never, never laugh when somebody slipped on a banana, you are engaged in a pretty serious self-deception that's going to send your soul straight to hell. So, if as a writer you are working with students and are saying you have to explore the, this totality. You know, it's not saying that that you should laugh or should not laugh. It's it's to allow this totality, uh, this totality to come out, so you can look at it. You too, as I said in this <coughs> earlier question, you too m might be put in a situation where you would shove somebody in to a gas chamber. Or let's even take it, let's take it to something like that situation in the movie or the book, Alive. You know, you are part of a rugby team that's crashed in a plane in the Andes, and you think, if I live, I can only live by eating my chum's thigh. What, I mean, this is a pretty big dilemma, you know. <coughs> and a lot of us would say, oh, I'd never do that. I'd ne you know, Jim, I like you, I'd never eat your thigh. You know, if you were dead there, I would... I would die before I ate that thigh. If you're a writer, you have to explore the possibility that you would eat that thigh. Not because you're taking it out of any moral dimension, but what you're doing as a writer is exploring the, totalita the totality of a human being. So I have a student in a workshop who writes a poem. This is this happens many times. A guy in a workshop writes a poem about seeing a girl walk down the street and he whistles at her. Very simple poem. I've been in occasions where he's been attacked in workshop for writing a, a sexually, uh, a politically incorrect poem, a sexist poem. Well, he feels guilty. He gets up in class and says, you're right, I should not have whistled at this girl. This all comes out of my personal experience. I saw this young woman She's 19, I'm 19, she's beautiful, I don't have a girlfriend, but I shouldn't even thought that way. I should have, I just should have taken my pecker out of my pants and slapped it left and right and shoved it back. What are we doing as writers? If our question is, how does one live? You have to explore that totality. The moment you start exploring that totality, you're overturning definitions of correctitude and propriety. Not to change them. You're looking under rocks, basically. You have no moral interest in this except as investigation. If you're in a, <coughs> in a closed society, English department, and are doing this, it can simply create a lot of friction. A lot of friction. You look at the history of any word. There are periods where that word, I mean, it goes to a word like lousy, you know. There's a period where that's a, a, a dirty word. Or you look at uh, the change of any word. You know, the word cute originally meant precise, acute. You know, it's the most precise thing. You look at the history of the word fuck, you know, how that comes out of, out of uh, different languages. How that, how that word is, or how any word is, at any moment of time, is governed by all kinds of historical forces around it. 
as a writer, you have to attune yourself to that. Because they're all notes that you're using. If I choose to use a word, I have to be able to anticipate exactly how that word's going to read, enter a reader's ear. <coughs> if I say something that the reader says, this is offensive, I have to know exactly that this was offensive. Because, again, I am dealing with a reader who's reading by anticipating what comes next. And I am creating patterns of tension and rest in order to affect that reader's journey forward in the poem. And my choice of words, is uh, my choice of diction, my choice of tone, my choice of pitch, all is designed to affect that reader's forward progression. If I, if I make it, I mean, so if I'm blocking it, making a surprise, et cetera, et cetera, all that finally is a matter of, of governing the situation. You go fishing, you play a fish, you have that fish on the line, give it too much slack, keep the line too tight, you got to keep that line just right, just right, just right. And the same thing with language through a poem or a novel. Uh, another of your characters, Frank McGinnis, uh, a poet, 